So uh, we'll we'll pick up where we left off. Have you heard from Doherty? Just one second. Okay. Right. Okay, so we'll pick we'll pick up where we left off before talking about bones in the in the shoulder. <laughs> so this is an anatomic diagram of uh, of the shoulder joint. You're all very familiar with it. The chromium process, the chromium clavicular joint, as we've been talking about, corcochromial ligament, the trapezoid portion of the CC ligament, the coronoid portion, the clavicle, and the cor corcoid process. Okay, so why don't we go on to this next case here. Sahar, what do you think of this? An 18-year-old male chronic left shoulder pain and graduated by trauma in 2008. And we have a frontal view of the shoulder. You see that there is some uh, decreased space. What? There is some uh, decreased space between the, right uh, the clavicle yeah, and okay. corcoid. Yeah. So this big bone projection yeah. here, here's a corcoid process which looks a little bit superior. Here's what the MR shows. So there is some osteoporosis. There's what? There is osteoporosis, like bony projection. Oh, okay, um, right. So, but we can see there's actually an articulation here between the clavicle and the coracoid process. Right, and here we can see it, uh, which is an abnormal joint, and we can see bone marrow edema associated with it. And then uh, this is, uh, over time, the actual edema got a little bit worse and the symptoms got worse. So... Is it like uh, kind of a correlation or...? Yeah, it's kind of like a correlation. It's, it's abnormal anatomy where you have a joint space where you shouldn't and it developed uh, arthropathy mm -hmm. uh, due to the increased stresses on the bones there. And this is uh, just an example of uh, an unusual condition that you have to be on the lookout for that can cause a shoulder pain. That's a genital anomaly then. I think so, right. You can also get acquired areas in this location. We actually saw some earlier this week here. If you have a clavicular fracture that heals with a lot of hypertrophic bone formation, you can then develop a secondary uh, pseudoarthrosis with the coracoid process. Very yeah. Uh, uh, shoulder pain, what do you think of this case? All right, so we have a coronal image of the shoulder, and it looks like uh, the superior labrum looks abnormal. It looks like there's a tear of the uh, type 1 or type 2 slap tear of the superior labrum. Um, uh, okay, so fraying at the free edge there. So you can, uh, yeah, the superior labrum is probably this. <coughs> uh, you, you need to see multiple cuts here, which okay. we don't have here. Uh, but uh, what's concerned here is notice here we can see articular cartilage up to that point. Yeah. And there's a big defect. And then there's a big defect. Yeah. I just kind of want to point this out that these cartilage defects can can be a little bit subtle. So it's important in when you're looking at these to take time to specifically look for the cartilage in the humeral head. Otherwise, yeah. these uh, full thickness defects, uh, which uh, aren't subtle at arthroscopy, can be easily missed on an MR study. And it just kind of shows the, the difference here. Okay. Uh, let's see who just joined us. Sam, how are you? Hi, sorry to be late. Oh, that's okay. Uh, Thomas, why don't you take this case? Uh, here's a coronal view of the shoulder. Uh, there's a little bit of degenerative change at the greater tuberosity, uh, the supraspinatus. A little bit of signal, but it's intact. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, the the glenoid looks intact on this view. And I guess oh geez, yeah, there's a condyle defect, humeral head, and a loose body. Yeah. So again, I just want to point out how subtle these can be. But here's a, a big loose body. Uh, which is articular cartilage, it was knocked off the humeral head. So that's the large cartilage frame. Sam, what do you think of this case? That also looks like a loose body, probably cartilage, maybe with possibly a 
bone too, but at least cartilage then I would say. Yeah, this is what a subtraction says here. And then uh, what do we see on the other images? Um, we see the yeah, loose body again there and The same patient, what do you see here? I think that's a cartilage defect in purely over the human head. Yeah. This, this one actually, you can see, is actually coming from the glenoid. Glenoid, yeah. Into the glenoid right in here. So another case of articular cartilage fragments. Okay, well, let's move on to inflammatory disease of the shoulder. And there are a lot of inflammatory conditions in the shoulder that uh, we talk about. Uh, <clears throat> you see here. So, uh, Sahar, what do you think of this case? Uh, normal or abnormal? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, we see a lot of synovial hypertrophy, erosion of the humeral head. So what do you think this is? Inflammatory, like, inflammatory arthropathy, like rheumatoid yeah. arthritis. And this is, this is yeah, severe, long-standing yeah. rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Okay, 18-year-old uh, man. And again, I see a large joint effusion. I see synovial thickening. Um, there's a little erosion there posterior. Okay, this is after contrast. So it looks like there's enhancement of the synovium and it's diffusely thickened. Okay. And they, they, this is a rheumatoid arthritis. So they actually previously had done a arthroscopic synovectomy, which in this day and age, you really wouldn't want to do for, for rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Sam, what? We used, we used to do a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Unfortunately, they didn't work out too well. Yeah. But nowadays, we have much better treatment, so that's good. So, uh, Sam, what do you think of this case? There's a lot of cartilage loss, full thickness, bone-on-bone -bone contact, subchondral edema, probably some sclerosis. There is an effusion. I, I'm not convinced that there's still thinking. I, th I think there's some, uh, they're inferiorly, but I'm not really sure. I mean, I think that the picture on the left is a, uh, is a T1, correct? T1 and a PD fat set. Okay. Um, and you were pointing something below the, the inferior capsule, which I guess is a lymph node. Yeah, this is a patient who had long-standing JRI, which now is called, uh, it's not called JRA, it's juvenile idiopathic arthritis. I think JIRA is what people like to use in this day and age. And these are actually uh, down here, they're, they're actually rheumatoid nodules <coughs> adjacent to the shoulder. On the axial images, we can see these nodules here. And uh, you can see the synovial thickening on the sagittal images. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Thomas. 49-year-old male, uh, pain three-year post-surfing injury. Uh, so I guess there is, was this an arthrogram? Or there's fluid in the joint and... I don't think it was an arthrogram. Well... I don't know. It doesn't matter. It could be. It doesn't matter whether it's north or north. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so, it's a little bit of uh, degeneration of the glenohumeral joint. There's not a lot of synovial thickening or maybe minimal synovial thickening. What's on? Uh, yeah, some synovitis at the axillary pouch and at the superior capsule. Yeah, this is all synovial uh, thickening. This, uh, I'm pretty sure this is a T1-weighted image. Uh, and then we can see a, a little traction cyst there. Maybe some cartilage thinning here and a little osteophyte. Here's some other images. Right, so next view, yeah, the synovium is a little more prominent. Uh, anteriorly and posteriorly, uh, synovial hypertrophy, 
Yeah, a lot of cartilage. Just thinking here. Here. And this and on the sagittal. Yeah, this is also chronic rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. Fortunately, we have much better treatment now for this condition, so hopefully we won't be seeing this uh, as we're going now. Long ascending shoulder pain again. We see a lot of synovial hypertrophy posteriorly. There are some erosive changes of the neural head. In the northern case of yeah, uh, big erosions and geodes <coughs> and erosive rheumatoid arthritis. <clears throat> All right, a couple uh, coronal images of the shoulder here. And it looks like there is again some synovial thickening, I think, sort of throughout. Where, where, where is that? Uh, superior to the humeral head, maybe. Yeah, right in there. So what space is that in? Uh, the subcoracoid subdeltoid bursa. So there's a big fluid, there's a big bursal fluid collection in the subcoracoid subdeltoid bursa. So it's bursitis. So this is some acromial bursitis. <clears throat> the cuff is intact in this particular case. So here you have to worry about, worry about any of the chronic inflammatory conditions and then uh, infections. Uh, uh, including uh, coxie and some of the more chronic type indolent type infections. Sam. 34 year old increasing pain seven months after was recovered repair rule out infection. Um, I, I'd say there's an infection. I mean, if they were already in there, they, they didn't see any of this. If it's new, then it's, it's gotta be an infection. I don't know what else would cause. What are your findings? So there's a lot of uh, synovial thickening. There's an effusion. There's also um, subacromial yeah. subdeltoid effusion. Yeah. How, ra uh, how rapidly do you get a – okay, so you have an effusion. What else do we have here? We have the rotator cuff tear. What else? Yeah. Uh, there's some synovial thickening or debris possibly inferiorly. Yeah, there's an erosion, but again, erosion also could be from infection. The question, I guess, to me is how just seven months after uh, – um, I, th I think it's, if, in my, in if, my opinion, if this, were infection, if this were infection, uh, what kind of infection is it? Uh, it could be like fungal if it's seven months or some, some atypical infection if it's seven months. I guess, I guess it could be, right? Uh, it could be bacterial. I, I would expect bacterial to be a little bit more acute, but. If it were bacterial, I would expect to see a lot of edema. I don't see any edema. That's true. Not really. The we'll erosion here is very sharply demarcated, and there's a huge amount of synovial thickening here. That takes a long, long time to develop this degree of synovial thickening. So if it were an infection, it would have to be some sort of very chronic indolent infection, but it's very it's not common to see this kind of synovial thickening even in an indolent infection. Okay. Was, this person didn't have any of that seven months ago? Uh, I'm not sure what they had seven months ago. But okay. the, at this point, this is all, uh, this is rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. They might have missed, they might have missed the boat. Yeah. Contrast would have probably helped there, right? Well, I mean, the question was contrast would help. It, you know, to me, I can see the synovial thickening here. The contrast would show the synovial thickening, mm -hmm. uh, but I think you can see it very nicely without contrast. Mm -hmm. But if you think this is too subtle and you want something that's really bright, then contrast could be helpful. Now, personally, I don't think it would be really that helpful here. You have to worry about a delayed infection, uh, which occurs in, in, in post-ops. Um, I've seen them as late as two years. Wow. Okay. And it's from the original surgery. Okay. Uh, the organism just sits there and uh, you, usually it's staph or I guess. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it flares up. But in, in this case, obviously, the patient probably had the disease uh, from the get go. Right. Right. 
Yeah, uh, and we'll see some bacterial infections and staph aureus infections later. Yes, I know, John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Thomas, what do you think of this case? Uh, so there's some fluid and edema deep to the scapula. And uh, yeah, I'm just not sure what space this would be in. It's called the scapulothoracic space. Yeah. So what's going on here? Uh, not aware of any bursa there. I guess you could have a, like a bursitis in this region. Okay, due to what? Uh, irritation. Uh, maybe they could have a osteochondroma that can cause irritation there. Okay, do you see an osteochondroma uh, here? Uh, I guess there is a little bit of a protrusion. Scapula, that, yeah, that shouldn't be there. <laughs> Pretty big one. Here <laughs> well, you can see it here. <laughs> That's an osteochondroma producing uh, scapulothoracic bursitis. Good. Okay. A three year old male with four weeks pain after four shots went to the home. Mm -hmm. So I see abnormal signal in all the Human neck mainly. You okay. don't see any definite fracture or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is right where they injected the uh, the oh, flu it's, shot. It's and uh, it was treated as osteomyelitis, but this was most likely. I mean, it, they could have they could have injected some infection, uh -huh. uh, but, it, but they never grew an organism. But they treated as those osteomyelitis. So it's probably. An inflammatory response to uh, to to the injection of the flu shot. Yeah. That's kind of a weird spot to inject. Yeah. Well, I guess it was a thin patient. They had a long needle. Nineteen-year-old. Well, what what happens now is, is uh, people that are not trained are doing the shots. Yeah. Uh, so it's yep. Thank gotta you. be a little careful these days. Yeah, like like me giving the shots here at Redman. <laughs> Except I was trained. <laughs> you, you didn't have any problem when I gave you the shot. No. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Yep. Okay. Nineteen year old female with shoulder pain after a fall. So I see a uh Somewhat well defined uh, lytic lucency in the uh, femoral head neck or the humeral head neck junction there. Okay. And, uh, so I, you know, this could be the symptomatic. Um, don't see any fluid levels. It looks like it's hyper intense on fluid sensitive sequences and on the. Yeah, there seems to be some. Uh... Uh, bony reactive changes around, around this. The margins are a little bit indistinct. And the fluid signal isn't just completely fluid on this. Uh, here we have the PD fat sat images. More hyper intense on the PD. Yeah, this fat is sat. gradient echo and this is a PD fat sat. And that's the prominent here. Uh, so, so, what's your differential for this? Um, infection. Could be on there. What uh, would this be? If it were infection, what would it be called? Brodyapsis. And what does that usually do to? Uh, you mean like a Brody's abscess? Right. Yeah. What's well, usually due to staph aureus? So yeah. So this is a Brody's abscess. Yeah. Pretty, pretty typical appearance, uh, with a little bit of uh, marrow edema surrounding, but you don't have to have the edema. More chronic Brody's abscesses, you can just see the fluid collection, but usually the fluid is inhomogeneous mm -hmm. on several of the sequences if you wound it properly, as opposed to a simple bone cyst, which doesn't have the bone reactive changes around it, and is usually pretty much a simple fluid. So how did uh, how did she get the infection from a fall? No, she didn't get it from a fall. That's just a uh, red herring. Commonly is what happened. This, these are all hematogenous spread. Right. Uh, they become chronic. In the meta always in the metaphysis uh, near near growth plate, and the symptoms kind of come and go. 
So this, the fall probably had nothing to do with the developed symptoms. This was incidental. The fall is just a red hair. Yeah, right. Okay, Sam, what do you think of this case? It's a child with fever and shoulder pain for one week. So this looks like somewhere in the shoulder. It's like just under the deltoid, I guess. Um, it's a fluid collection surrounding soft tissue edema. So with fever and pain and collection, it, it was an abscess. And this turned out to be an abscess. I don't remember what the organism was, but this was a bacterial abscess. Okay, hey, Thomas. A 62-year-old male, shoulder pain for 10 days. Uh, so there's some fluid in the subacromial septeltoid bursa. And there's a peripherally enhancing fluid collection. Um, I guess deep to the deltoid, or sort of in the supraspinatus fossa. Yeah, it's in the supraspinatus so muscle, I think. Okay. So yeah, it would be uh, there's the nap infection. The tendon, and then we can see that this, this is what it looks like under an ultrasound. And uh, when they opened this up, this was uh, pus came out of this, and both both the subacromial subdeltoid bursa and the and the and the muscle. Yeah, maybe a lot of this is artifact from the, from the coil, but you can see there's a little bit of fluid there. Yeah, there's a small amount of fluid. Yeah. So this is eight three eleven, and then uh, they did a surgical procedure. Looks torn still. Um, okay. So now we're 11.22.11. We can see they put in the right. suture anchors. There's some postoperative change here, but we still see the tear. Let's see. It's a fair amount of edema here. Let's see. Let me go back. This is 8.3.11. You know, this is probably a month or two after the surgery. And we're seeing more bone edema than we you typically see after putting suture anchors in. And we can see a lot of fluid right. here, uh, as well as, as the tear. Uh, and this was a this is all due to a post-op infection. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't remember the organism. It was probably Staph aureus, but it could have been something else. But you can see the indistinctness. You can see all the edema within the adjacent muscles. So when you have a, a bacterial infection, usually you get a lot of edema adjacent to the fluid collections with the one exception or, yeah, I mean, you can always have all kinds of exceptions, but it's usually you have edema. With uh, Brody's abscesses, <laughs> it's often chronic and walled off enough where you may not have edema surrounding Brody's abscesses. Okay, arm pain developed after surgery. So this patient has an arthroplasty there. And I'm trying to, it looks like it's superiorly displaced. Yeah, it's a little bit superior. Here's the glenoid. So it's a little superiorly displaced, and we're mm -hmm. seeing some funny some densities here. Yeah, some curvilinear calcification yeah. or density. Yeah. Yeah. Funny thing here. So, and then, the, so they got a CT scan. So, what does the CT scan look like? Mm. So, it looks like uh, multiple hyperdense. Um, body is sort of throughout the upper extremity there. Um, and the antibiotic <laughs> so, so this was a patient who developed a post-op infection. They wanted to try to treat it without removing the hardware if possible. Uh -huh. So they gave IV antibiotics, but then they put these, and they had a large abscess collection, they put these uh, antibiotic beads in it, hoping that it would give a long-term antibiotic and be able to treat the infection without having to go in and do a surgery. I don't know the results of this, mm. but that's what it looks like. Okay. Uh, Sam, what do you think of this one? Not much. 
I think. Uh, are those real yeah, little no, hypo? Sorry. This patient almost died. Okay. <laughs> Carry on. Uh, thank you. Are those real little hyper intensities? I mean, hyper densities in the shoulder, or is it just is that artifactual? These little things here. Yeah. I don't know. I think I don't know. I think it's artifact. Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is falling. Okay. Okay. I mean, could you t could you see the soft tissue swelling, Dr. Cruz? Can I see the swelling here? Yeah, that you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't say that's maybe just muscle or something, just fat. Uh, the fat plate's a little indistinct. I, I do think that this is a fuller than it should be. Okay, and the bone margins are so sharp. But it's 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 tough on a. Uh, on plane film, sometimes to see that, especially in weightlifters and, and, and big guys. And it could be a very large muscle mass here. Uh, yeah. okay. so, uh, they saw this. He had pain. Uh, they decided to uh, treat it with steroid injections. So they put in a steroid injection to try to decrease oh, no. shoulder pain. And, the, and the, the, you know they thought he probably had some sort of a strain or injury, uh, water skiing. Uh, those, that's this time. He developed increasing pain and swelling, and a few weeks later, he had this MR scan. Oh, uh, so I mean, probably it was an infection, and they just made it worse by putting the steroids in there. I, I, don't, now there's a, there's, I, I don't know when the infection occurred. It could have I been see. the time of the injection. I see. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a lot of pain a lot. Might, have, might have been a a tendon or a muscle strain at the beginning. Uh -huh. They injected it with steroids, and then I think a week or two later, he he developed a lot of a lot of pain. And actually, at this time, he was actually getting delirious. So he went from here to the to the hospital. So what do you wow. think is going on here? Uh, there's a large subacromial subdeltoid effusion. It's kind of heterogeneous. I think there's involvement of. Uh, he didn't go to the hospital at this point. He's still an outpatient, and they got this this scan. Uh, I'm sorry. Keep going. I think there's involvement of the supraspinatus, um, and possibly the bone, possibly the humeral head is involved also. Yeah, we're, we're not quite. We don't have good images of the bone here. Uh, okay. So we see this big fluid collection. It's really in the subacromial subdeltoid versa. Uh, so mm -hmm. this was called a rotator cuff tear. Oh. Interpretation. And here are the, the sagittal images showing the signal in the cuff and this huge amount of fluid, which has a very uh, inhomogeneous appearance if you window and level it, and a subacromial subdeltoid versa. So. Well, okay. There's no fever at this point? He did have a fever. Oh, okay. I mean, to be fair, you told me the patient almost died, so now I'm thinking something like infection, but otherwise. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't expect this much effusion in the sub subdeltoid bursa from a rotator cuff tear. There's not that much yes, fluid to the joints. So. Okay. Anyways, um, yeah, like, again, just well, he, has a, he has Sorry? an infection all the way around his shoulder. Right. They, that's that's what I'm saying. That's that's what I figure it is. I mean, I'm I'm a little biased, but even without the information that Dr. Cruz gave us, I would think that this effusion could not be accounted for by just the rotator cuff tear. Especially because there's not that much fluid in the shoulder joint itself, so. So it's called a rotator cuff. Harsh partial. It's called a rotator cuff tear. He was sent home. Uh, I then got a, got a call asking for a second opinion, and at that time the doctor, I think he was in the doctor's office, and his mental status was very abnormal, and uh, we interpreted this as an infection. He was sent into the hospital. And uh, they they uh, pulled out Staph aureus, and he had a septicemia at that time. He grew it both out of the, the shoulder uh, aspiration as well as his blood cultures, and he was placed on antibiotics. Uh, there's not much edema in the bone. In bone marrow. Yeah, not in the, not at, not at this point. Okay. Uh, wait a second. Let me think. I think this. Uh, 
Okay, so, okay. So, uh, Thomas, here's another case. This is a patient with three, three weeks of increase in pain. Right. Uh, I would say the musculature looks uh, very abnormal. There's fluid collections and throughout the muscle and maybe some atrophy associated with it also. There's some edema in the humeral head. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I'd be suspecting either a myositis or maybe an infection if there's any history of... Okay. Well, how would myositis... Uh... Uh, be associated with bone marrow edema. Yeah, that would be uh, like a component of osteomyelitis yeah. if it was infectious. It would be more infectious then, right? So here's some other images. Uh, so there's some susceptibility artifact. Yeah, the okay. proximal humerus. So what do you can I roll back? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so I guess, yeah, if that's uh, some post I have air. Okay. The, uh, yeah, excellent. Yeah. That, that's that's yeah. gas, isn't it? Yes, John. <laughs> yeah, you gave it away. Yeah, so, th so this is an anaerobic. Oh, shucks. <laughs> yeah, so this is this was an anaerobic infection, and those, those were. Uh, well, geez, I was right. You were, absolutely. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Couldn't resist. Couldn't resist. Yeah, I know. Well, you're right. Okay. Nine-year-old male, right shoulder pain. This is really three years ago. Our trust of the work with the cup paper. 2011, we threw over to the cough using allograph graph and relation on the right shoulder pain. Okay, we have seen a part of you of the shoulder. See much in the bone. Okay, so we have score anchors in the humeral head. We have open material of the orbital cuffs for sinus. And we have the. Okay, posteriorly we have, yeah, like, that, that could be part of the joint. It looks like fluid collection. Okay, there is fluid, there is synovial hypertrophy. We have fracture or depression of the humeral head superiorly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of edema in the bone. Okay, a lot of bony erosion, those calcifications in the joint of loose bodies. Real destruction. Yeah. Extensive destruction of the yeah. humeral head now. Okay. So, what do you think is going on here? Infectious process. Mm -hmm. So let me see what we have. This is on uh, 12 19 2011. This is 3 27 2012, so we're like four months later. And uh, progression. And here, similar time. This was the you know, month after that, which looks like more destructive disease. And this was, uh, they went in surgery, and this was candida infection. And that's what they did. That's a fusion. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. So let's go back. So, yeah. So they had to fuse the joint. Right. Sorry, I, I don't understand. Is this a temporary procedure? Does it look temporary? No. What, why? Oh uh, no! This is permanent fusion. What? That, that that arm is just out of commission for life now? Yep. The shoulder is. Why not just replace? Why not just, well, you can't, in other words, the arm, you can't, why not just replace the shoulder? Is that not possible because of the infection? Or, I mean, presumably they cleared the infection if they did surgery, right? Well, I, I would have to uh, conclude that, that they um, got rid of the infection. Otherwise, they couldn't do this. Yeah. So why not just put a, a new shoulder in or something? But uh, the, the way this was handled, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I sure would like to get a good history on this. Okay. Uh, presumably, they felt there's too much damage to be able to do a shoulder replacement, but we, we don't know. 
well, a shoulder replacement uh, with an infection is probably worse than trying this. Okay. <clears throat> Seventy-three-year-old woman, shoulder pain for two months. So it looks like there is a uh, large fluid collection in the subacromial slash subdeltoid bursa. Uh, it looks like there's enhancement of the uh, bursa, some synovial thickening. This looks like an infection to me. Infection of the the. Uh, what kind of infection do you think? Any suggestion, thoughts? Um, do, you think it's, do you think it's a regular bacteria? No, this looks this looks more. So you have a, a lot of a lot, lot, of, a lot of big big areas of food problems. Yeah, all around the place. So maybe like a fungal or TB potentially. So this TB. is typical TB. It's big uh, fluid collection around the, the joints. Uh, Sam, what do you think of this one? Um, right shoulder resting pain and weakness, remote onset, um, blood tenderness, GT or SST. What is that? LT. What does that mean? I think that's just probably locations around the shoulder where there's tenderness. Greater trochanter okay. supraspinatus tendon, uh, lesser trochanter tro anterior inferior lemma. Okay. All right. Um, I, I don't know if that's fatty atrophy of the musculature. First of all, in the top left and top right, or, or if there's in. Uh, or if there's some kind of soft tissue process, edema or something going on in there, I'm not sure. So it looks That's... like all the rotator cuff muscles are really abnormal. Yeah. So it's uh, so a T2. Well, I mean, it, just that one picture could be either fatty atrophy or just diffuse edema, I guess. But but then it suppresses, so it looks like fatty atrophy. Um, there's a little bit of edema in there, probably. But most of it looks like fat. Yeah. Um. Again, some edema and atrophy. There are not many muscle fibers. So, 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 what are you thinking about to have someone who'd have all this kind of muscle atrophy? Um, and edema, like, it could be diabetes. Um, could be could, if it's if it's all of this so, so extensive, it could be something in like the brachial plexus, maybe. Okay, could be a brachial plexus. Uh, uh, diabetes for the shoulder would be really, I've, I've never heard of that, but I, uh, it would affect, diabetes tends to affect the longer nerves first, so it would start in the hands and or the feet really, and then maybe the hands, but the feet are really the characteristic location for diabetes. Uh, yeah. This isn't diabetes. Uh, Brachi brachial plexus problem? Sure, brachial plexus problem. Uh, this turned out to be polio. So with polio, you can you get focal areas where you get denervation, and uh, they can basically be anywhere in the body, uh, and it, that's that's what leads to all the deformities that are characteristic. Is when the muscles stop working, other muscles take over, and you get the bony deformity secondary to not having a balanced uh, strain from the from normal muscles. So mm -hmm. if you see this focally, then <laughs> I've seen a good number of cases. Yeah. Hopefully, not anymore. Well, you guys probably haven't. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Tom. They, they, they used to come from. They used to come from Mexico. Really? Yeah, I believe it. But there, there, there are cases of. I think probably a little few areas where it's. They see some cases again now because uh, so many people around the world are no longer immunizing their kids. So, let's see it again. Okay, uh, Thomas. A 65-year-old female localized multiple well-defined multiple well erythematous nodules on the right arm for one year. 
Uh, so we have axial T1 images. Yeah, there's a effacement of subcutaneous fat along the right deltoid or superficials of the deltoid muscle. Okay, so we have uh, some these lesions within the fat, really, right? Right. Okay. Uh, Here's what the T2 looks like. So on T2, the same signal intensity as fat. Yeah, some areas may be slightly brighter, but uh, that's right. So yeah, so they could be fluid filled. Uh, yeah, yeah, right now yeah, it sounds like some fluid filled or cystic structures and on ultrasound, they, they're not simple. They're not simple. They, they actually turn out not to have any flow. And this is sparganosis. Huh. Here you're all familiar. You've seen a lot of cases of sparganosis. <laughs> it's a parasitic infection, oh. uh, typically in, uh, in Asia. I knew that. Yes. Okay. I'm just kidding. I didn't. <laughs> okay. Muscle pain and weakness. So watch what you eat. <laughs> Okay, now there's a lot of muscle edema. Um, some enhancement on the post contrast. And the myopathy. Mainly in the deltoid. Here's a T1. Are there different times? These are all the same time. Same time. Yeah, same study. T1, the stir shows a lot of edema within the muscles. The T1 fat sat post. Uh, we need a pre to really determine it, probable enhancement. But here we got the axis, which shows that there is enhancement in this kind of spidery, uh, non mass like manner, which we see here involving a number of muscles. Like myositis? Like yeah. This was actually dermatomyositis. But putting it in the myositis group is, is great. 15 year old man, shoulder and thigh pain. So it looks like sort of diffusely the muscles look abnormal. Um, again, it looks like there's hyper intense signal throughout the muscles. Um, what are you thinking about? Another sort of myositis. Yeah. yeah. This is juvenile dermatal myositis made here by a rectal biopsy. Okay. Sam? Okay. Um, I think on the computer that I'm looking at, <laughs> Uh, I think there's some lucidity in the greater tuberosity of the humerus, probably maybe some swelling over the proximal arm laterally. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, here is, sure. let's go through the CT. Okay, uh, there's some asymmetric edema in the supraspinal, oh, maybe, right? It's swelling, thickening, maybe. I think it's muscle edema. Um, it, I don't know. I don't know how much of this is um, artifact, but it looks like there's asy asymmetric density in the musculature. Maybe. Oh, that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, um, hmm. See, thirty and nineteen. Yeah. So. Looks like probably edema on the left. Then, no, I'm sorry. On the on the on, on the yeah, the density is less on the left. So yeah, on, maybe on, on the still right. pretty, pretty pretty subtle. Yeah, Here's the MR. Yeah, it's the, the edema and so it's a supraspinatus. <sighs> um, just the one muscle, huh? I wonder, could this be like a, a, oh, 
is that infraspiny a little bit of the infraspiny just maybe is involved maybe and then deltoid up here a little deltoid okay hmm I, it, let me see there you go supraspinous uh, supra and infraspinous maybe a little deltoid extensive is there a lesion okay um bone scan looks like increased signal in the musculature which is not specific it just tells us there's increased blood flow we could have gotten this information from probably the last two scans okay oh was this was this patient like doing some extraneous sorry some strenuous exercise with that limb maybe? my well head then yes <laughs> sorry yes yeah right the way what was the patient doing? I don't know. Thomas, what do you think of this case? A uh, 49 year old with pain on methotrexate and prednisone, no fever, no chills. Uh, so there's diffuse edema surrounding the humeral head and scapula. And Fluid uh, extending into the oh, fasciitis. This was used in the fasciitis. And, uh, so this is really an immune uh, mediated uh, inflammatory condition. Yeah, this patient actually did not have uh, an injection. Oh, no injection. Yeah, but this this was turned out to be hemorrhage around an arthroscopic oh, portal uh, with uh, blood extending down along the okay. deltoid. Okay. So uh, let's finish off today talking a little bit about <clears throat> frozen shoulder or adhesive capulitis. Capulitis. Uh, it really starts out with acute edema. Uh, uh, you, you can see edema, especially in the rotator cuff interval, and then you can get a lot of capsular thickening. Classically, there are four stages. <clears throat> the first stage is between zero and three months. The second stage classically is the next six months. Stage three is nine to 15 months, and typically stage four goes out to, to 24 months or two years. Uh, in the first two stages, you can have increasing synovitis and inflammatory changes if you biopsy the the synovium of the shoulder. And then you start getting fibrotic changes, and then things start to going back a little bit toward normal. And that's, but uh, one thing I wanted to point out, we had a, a, a case today of uh, six months out of someone who still was symptomatic with it, adhesive capsulitis. I think the referring physicians were concerned something else was going on. But you can see here, classically, it really takes mm -hmm. about two years. And you can have increasing symptoms really up through the first year and then stabilizing and then getting better in the, in the second year. So it's a, it can be a very frustrating disease for that reason. And so here we can see this is a person with early symptoms of uh, uh, pain with uh, motion of the shoulder. And you can see a lot of edema around the inferior capsule in this area, which is a common location for involvement with this condition. That's uh, capsular edema. You're all familiar with this uh, paper from Mingiardi, uh, where they look at the uh, CC ligament up here and the uh, rotator cuff interval fat. And uh, th that's the way it should normally look, corcohumeral ligament. And then when you start getting some chronic capsulitis, you can get thickening of the capsule in this location, uh, which obscures portions of the fat within the, uh, within the interval. And then you can uh, stage this by showing increased loss of the normal fat. Uh, this is just a little effacement. Here's much more so, and it's complete uh, socked in loss of the fat within the rotator cuff interval. 
you can see these uh, with ultrasound findings. And one of the things you often look for is the biceps tendon, because the biceps tendon is uh, intimately involved here. And uh, many people believe that a lot of the symptoms of pain with uh, adhesive capsulitis is actually involvement of the, the scar tissue adhesing to the biceps. Then whenever you flex and move the biceps, it irritates it, producing shoulder pain. Yeah, uh, the problem uh, in his book um, and and others um, uh, thought that um, the disease started with um, the long head of the biceps tendon and then progressed. Yeah, uh, that, that that was the first uh, uh, sign of uh, of frozen shoulder. And that's why we really look in the rotator cuff interval. Because uh, yeah, uh, that's where here we can. Well, he didn't know that, but they 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 dissected a lot of cases. Um, he had patients uh, that they treated, and then they um, donated their shoulders uh, for research. And and then uh, when they died, uh, they did dissections and. And, and and came to these conclusions. Great. And here we get It's kind of interesting. Yeah, we got a question about that. What, why is the inferior capsule thickening so important if the primary process is uh, um, what's called biceps long head 10? Uh, well. uh, I, I really don't know, and I don't think anybody else knows. Uh, um, I I don't think it's limited to the biceps. I think it's a no, 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 no. It's not. But that's the beginning of the the problem. Um, and that's where where it actually first appears, and then progresses to other areas. And I think that's an area where I, I, I don't know what uh, the MRI. Um, um, community has uh, come up with, but that's uh, that's the old uh, um, uh, pathology uh, dissections showed. Yeah, and, and I think uh, uh, often that's an area that has the most symptoms, so you kind of pick it up early when it involves there. Uh, and uh, another area where we can easily see it with MR is in the inferior capsule, but it's other places as well. It's just that it's the, those are the two areas where we can see it relatively easily with MR. Uh, it doesn't mean it's not elsewhere as well. It's just harder to detect as a specific abnormality in other locations within the shoulder. And here, we, right, thank you. here we can see that. And that's, about, that, that's about the only time you see the capsule it's when you have this condition. Yeah. And here we can see synovial thickening around the lung head of the biceps tendon here on the ultrasound as well. Same thing here. And then uh, if you inject the joint space, you tend to have a limited amount of uh, volume within the joint space. That used to be one of the diagnostic criteria. In fact, a lot of people like to do arthrography because then they felt that you should blow it up and that would treat it by getting rid of the adhesions within the joint space. Uh, nowadays, people don't really believe that, that philosophy as much. So it was first described by, uh, well, really, uh, there were some early descriptions that kind of fit the bill back in 1872, uh, but it was uh, Codman in 34 and then uh, Navizar in 1945 really started the, the more of the current concept about a frozen shoulder. And it's an insidious onset pain. Originally, at the beginning, it tends to be more at night, and then you really lose uh, motion, you know, with a lot of pain with motion. And it typically occurs in the fifth and sixth decades, much more common in women than in men. Is there an inciting event, or does it just sort of? Uh, you mean is is there a sex like, trauma or something that yeah, starts it? Yeah, is there it? some sort of trauma? Or... John, are you aware of, of any trauma kicking this off? I'm not. Um, yeah, some cases like um, 
fracture uh, of the wrist um, in, in women and um, bruises. Okay. Uh, also, uh, of the upper extremity onset of the disease. But we really don't know whether that the trauma does it or whether it's just going to happen anyway. Uh, I, I, and it, it's much more common in diabetics and, and in smokers. It's a, it's a, yeah, diabetics have a propensity for it. Um, also, um, uh, there's something to do with uh, the nervous system also. Uh, okay. And then uh, in some papers, they talk about three phases, the early freezing, freezing phase, which is the most symptomatic, which really is in the first nine months, uh, then kind of an adhesive stage, and then the resolution stage coming out. And some papers, there's only full recovery in about 40%. Some it's a little bit higher than that. Uh, but uh, typically, 60 to 80% end up uh, doing, doing well uh, functionally. And they all have some stiffness yeah. um, as far as motion goes. Uh, I've never seen a case where they had a complete resolution um, okay. um, of, of motion. Okay. All right. Uh, and then there's some other things that are associated as well as thyroid disease and Parkinson's. So why don't we stop here and we'll... Uh, Try to pick this up uh, on Monday. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.